Welcome to episode five of This Is Not A Conspiracy Theory, my 2020 documentary series. In this episode, we leave behind the world of conspiracies and enter the world of systems, the unseen rules of the game. And this is where the most potent form of power resides. As infants, we have to solve one mystery after another. We don't understand anything we hear, see, or experience. Our every encounter with the world is a puzzle we need to solve. Initially, we only learn through our own experiences. But in time, we can learn through the experiences of others. We're told stories, we have conversations, we're taught, we observe. And after that, more and more, we watch and read and listen to media. We absorb ideas from countless people, from far more people than we could ever meet. Throughout this entire process, as we absorb knowledge of the world, our unconscious mind is busy building something. It's building a kind of simulation, a map of reality, a mental model. Our theories, our stories, our ideologies, all of these are mental models. They're simplified representations of reality. System scientist Jay Forrester claims, the image of the world around us, which we carry in our head, is just a model. Nobody imagines all the world, government, or country. He has only selected concepts and uses those to represent the real system. What we consider real often isn't real. It's filtered through the lens of our mental model, transformed and given meaning. When we look at the world, we often see what our mental model is designed to see. As we construct our mental models over the years, we sometimes intentionally choose its components. We take on this ideology or that ideology, this narrative or that narrative, we subscribe to this theory or another theory. But much of our mental model is created out of ideas that were chosen for us. We inherit these ideas from our family, our country, our culture. And one of the most powerful ideas we've all inherited is the mechanical vision of early science. This vision of control and planning penetrated deep into Western culture and spawned the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, which gave birth to modern democracy, capitalism, and the industrial revolution. The advent of the internal combustion engine virtually created both the modern petroleum industry and the automobile industry. All these are part of a modern age of machines powered by petroleum, coal, and electricity. Science offered an awesome ability to control the world around us. It seemed to promise one of humanity's most yearned for abilities, the power to predict the future. French scientist Pierre Simon Laplace imagined a world where we could foresee the movements of the greatest bodies of the universe and those of the tiniest atom. Nothing would be uncertain and the future, just like the past, would be present before our eyes. Isaac Asimov later dramatized this premise in his 1951 novel, Foundation, in which a branch of mathematics called psychohistory can predict thousands of years into the future. But humanity's dreams of predicting our future would never be realized. And when we look back at the many predictions of the past, it's clear we have little idea what the future will bring. By 2020, we'll have computers that are powerful enough to simulate the human brain. By 2029, and I've been quite consistent on this date, we will have completed the reverse engineering of the human brain. As soon as we started creating moving images, creating virtual worlds drawn from our imaginations, we started creating images of the future. And ever since, futuristic visions continue to fascinate us. We imagine other realities, utopias, dystopias, technological marvels, barren and brutal wastelands. And in less fantastical ways, we spend a lot of our time imagining the future. Fox polls show Hillary Clinton leading with 48% of the vote. In news media, speculation about the future is an obsession. We are actually about to find out if Russia maybe has something on the new president. We're about to find out if the new president of our country is going to do what Russia wants. We're drawn to figures who envision the future or even create it. We can now place the knowledge of our civilization accessible to our fingertips. And this is going to be revolutionary in the humanities. 
and we entrust the highest levels of responsibility to those whose story of the future we find the most appealing. And we will take back this country for you, and we will make America great again. Our focus on the future is well-founded. The future is where we will all spend the rest of our lives. But we tend to forget all these predictions and speculations and don't notice we're mostly wrong about the future. Trump would not be permitted to win. We seem incapable of imagining the coming decades and the coming centuries. History starkly demonstrates this inability. The American Revolution, World War I, the assassination of JFK, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the 9-11 attacks, the 2008 financial crash, Brexit, Trump, the rise of nationalism, all of these were not foreseen by powerful and well-informed elites. Nassim Nicholas Taleb refers to events like these as black swans, massive, history-defining occurrences that we fail to foresee, then convince ourselves afterwards they actually were foreseeable. Taleb argues that the future will be increasingly less predictable. No one, from the most powerful empires, to the richest companies, to technology's most brilliant visionaries, knows much about where we are headed. So we can look into the future, and we can see what might exist, and it's gonna be really, really good. Our world is now too immense, too interconnected, and too fast to fully comprehend, let alone control. Society is a large and diverse collection of individuals who interact through rules. Systems like these are often impossible to predict, and this can be demonstrated with a pencil and a sheet of paper using a simple game invented many decades ago. In the late 60s, the mathematician John Conway invents a sort of game. He calls it simply life. He considers it a hobby and refers to it as recreational mathematics. The game of life is amazingly simple. It's played like this. If you fill in a square on a sheet of graph paper, it's alive. If it's empty, it's dead. A dead cell with three live neighbors will become alive. A live cell with one or fewer neighbors will die. A live cell with four or more neighbors will also die. A live cell with two or three live neighbors remains alive. There's no objective to the game. All you do is fill in some cells, apply the rules repeatedly, and watch the patterns unfold. The game of life was even more dramatic once it was programmed on computers, where the rules play out quickly on an infinite plane. Over the years, it's been adapted to three dimensions, emulated in Minecraft, and life simulations have been run within life simulations. What happens in the game of life is fascinating because it is truly unpredictable, even though the rules are so simple. Some of the patterns quickly stop, some morph endlessly, some produce animations similar to early video games. In the game of life, the only way to truly know what will happen is to keep playing the game. John Conway himself never saw much merit in his little hobby. He considered it more of a curiosity, not real mathematics. But for many others, the game of life was profound because it offered a bare glimpse of how the marvelous complexity that surrounds us is generated. Complexity could be generated from simple rules. Everything is a Remix has the best shirts on the internet. We've got a brand new shop, new colors, new shipping, and lady styles. See the link below. John Conway had created a simple kind of system, a collection of parts connected by rules that functions as a whole. And when parts become interdependent, something unexpected can emerge. They no longer behave predictably and repetitively. They start to appear alive. And as a whole, they can even do things the individual parts can't. They can create something called emergence. Even the game of life creates a little form of emergence. The elaborate motions of the cells aren't defined by the rules. They emerge from the rules. The game of life is similar in structure to nature, but nature is a far more sophisticated type of system. Nature is a complex system. We see complex systems everywhere. The ants in a colony, the cells in your immune system, the neurons in your brain. 
Unlike in the game of life, the parts in natural systems can make choices, they can learn and adapt. And the emergence of complex systems is far more stunning and mysterious than the simple animations of the game of life. Ants and bees create elaborate colonies with features like thermostats and waste disposal. Your immune system protects your body from infection and keeps you alive. And neurons somehow create consciousness, create you. All this is done without a plan. No one is orchestrating everything. Complex systems are created not from the top down, but from the bottom up. They're self-organized as the parts of the system respond to rules. And somehow this creates emergence, new qualities that don't exist in the parts. Society is a complex system and we are its parts. And the emergent outcomes are cities, economies, cultures, countries. None of these are planned by the participants. They are emergent. And this complex system is countless times more complex than ant colonies or immune systems or even brains. The scale and speed of this system is such that no group of elite geniuses knows where this game is headed. While we don't know how to control complex systems, we do know how to influence them. We humans have the unique ability to change the rules of the system and even create new rules. The players within the game can choose the rules of the game. These rules can be found in the systems that surround us, everywhere from the global systems of modern life to the tiny systems we create in our personal lives. <laughs>